This is episode 73 of the Christian Travelers Network. Today we'll be talking about Facing Pain with Courage with Joe Patterson. Welcome to the Christian Travelers Network, where travel stories, community, and scripture combine. Hey, Christian Travelers, I am so glad that you are here. We have an awesome guest, Joe Patterson, who's going to be talking about some kind of crazy travel stories and some almost near-death experiences uh, that he has experienced in his travels. But before we dive into that, I want to once again point you to our website, christiantravelers.net. There you'll find other faith and travel resources, including um, our links to our Facebook group, Instagram, Pinterest, and in about two months, we're going to start booking trips. So keep your eyes and ears out for that. And if you want updates about that, you can sign up for our email. Uh, That is also on our website. But without further ado, Joe Patterson is an adventurer, guitarist, writer, gas station food connoisseur, and is known for his loud laughter. Hey, Joe, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Sarah? I am doing awesome. I have never heard of anyone who has called themselves a gas station connoisseur. What is your favorite gas station food? Uh, It would be Casey's Pizza, no contest. Oh my gosh. Breakfast or like another meal? Uh, Breakfast pizza is solid. Casey's breakfast pizza is very solid. I do prefer just their regular pizza a little bit over the breakfast pizza. Okay. Hands down. I went, um, so I just moved to Nashville and, uh, the other day I was actually craving Casey's breakfast pizza. That's my preferred one. Um, but I found out that the closest one was 50 miles away from Nashville. So on our next trip, my husband totally like made a detour to make sure we stopped for Casey's pizza. (laughs) (laughs) So you know, Casey's then, so you understand, you understand it's good pizza. It's amazing pizza. <laughs> yeah, that's um that this is actually the reason I call myself a gas station food connoisseur is uh I've I've had a little bit of a different pandemic experience than uh, everybody else. Um you know <laughs> I I wound up joining a country band uh like right at the start of the pandemic. Um and being here in Nebraska we've been able to actually still do a lot of touring and playing shows. Um, you know, it's, it's been all outdoor events that have been socially distanced and stuff like that, but we've still been able to play. And so I've traveled a lot this summer. I've probably put over 7,000 miles on my car, uh, since like the end of May. And so I'm stopping at gas stations and I'm scrounging for food a lot. Uh, so I've, I've learned a lot by experience, not always great experience, like (laughs) where the good places are, where the not so good places are. Uh, that makes me want to ask then what is your least favorite gas station food? Uh, I would say it's any time I am at somewhere like too late to get, you know, like Casey's or something like that. And I have to settle for just like the prepackaged you know, sandwiches or, or whatever that are just in the, the coolers at some of these places. Uh, that's pretty, that's pretty sad times. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. So it, you are in a band and, uh, you have some travel experiences, but can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, what you all do and. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a youth pastor here in Western Nebraska been here for the better part of like 10 years now. Um, it's, it's pretty wild. I love being a youth pastor. I love working with students. Uh, I'm a seven on the Enneagram, uh, if you're at all into that, which basically just means that my personality type, I love to have fun and I have a lot of different interests. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like I said, I currently play lead guitar for a high profile country artist named Luke Mills based here in Nebraska. Uh, I produce another podcast called Parks and Rewatch with my co-host Joy. That's a, a weekly podcast. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I do love to travel. I've gone on backpacking trips and road trips all over the U.S. Most of these trips have been solo trips, uh, just me, my, myself, or 
me and my German Shepherd Griffin. So I've learned a lot about both myself and the art of traveling alone to unfamiliar places while on these trips. That's awesome. And you have actually written a book about one of your experiences with Griffin. Yeah. Yeah. It's called The Legend of Griffin. It's available on Amazon as a Kindle version, a paperback version, and actually an audible version that I narrated myself. That's very impressive. In your book, you talk a lot about courage and kind of facing your fears. Can you tell us a little bit about how you define courage? Absolutely. Um, You know, there's a lot out there, and it might sound a little cliched, but I think the Theodore Roosevelt quote sums it up pretty well for me when he says, courage is not about having the strength to go on. It is going on when you don't have the strength. There's a level of understanding there that I think is pretty profound. I think everyone has the strength to be brave, but most people hit, they tend to hit this threshold of fear or discomfort and stop there. And to me, courage is everything that happens on the other side of that threshold. Last week, we had a a podcast guest talk about like the bridge of the faithful it's one thing to know that Christ died for us, but it's another thing to step out in faith. And that kind of sounds a lot like your analogy for courage. It's that stepping out and what happens past that point. Was that Jenna? Yes. Yeah, I know Jenna. She's good people. Oh, nice. How do you guys know each other? Well, fun story. She almost wound up being the co-host for my other podcast. Oh, really? Yeah, she was really interested in the idea, and I would have loved to move forward with her, but at the time, she decided she didn't quite have enough time to, to focus on that. But, uh, but she's, a, she's a friend of our show, and, and yeah, we love Jenna. She's great. That's awesome. Small world. Yeah, <laughs> at least in the, in the Christian podcasting community. Absolutely. So um, in terms of courage, how do you personally relate that to your faith walk? You know, I I think for me, it's remembering that God has ordained my steps. And even when I'm in places that make me feel afraid or make me, you know, falter, that God has planned and equipped for me to be here. And it's courage to trust. It's Mm -hmm. courage to trust that he's given me what I need and that he's going to see me through, and that no matter what I'm walking through, he's walking with me. Absolutely. And um, you had an experience that really required that courage, that trust um, of God kind of going out into South Dakota with Griffin. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty far-reaching experience, I think, as far as, you know, what led to this and and everything. So just to kind of set the stage, I I grew up as a pastor's son in Northeast Colorado, um, one of four kids. Uh, A week after I graduated high school in 2007, my parents gathered us around the dining room table, and that's where we found out that they were splitting up and mom was leaving. It rocked us all pretty hard at that point. I don't think any of us kids saw it coming. And because I had just graduated, it felt like being thrown out into the world with no sense of guidance or security at that point. Hmm. I I felt like I kind of had to figure it all out for myself without my family to help me because now all of us are just doing our best to keep our heads above water. <laughs> Where do you uh, fall in the family? Were you the youngest or kind of in between? I'm the second oldest. My sister's older than me, and I have two younger brothers. So there were still some at home trying to figure things out there, too. Yeah, I think one brother was maybe 16 at the time, and one was closer to 12 or 13. So I wound up not going to college that fall. I just stayed around that area and worked a few different jobs. It was not a good year. For me. Uh, I was spiraling. I was angry. I was pretty bitter. Uh, and that bitterness kind of, you know, it bounced around, I think, from focal point to focal point, but ultimately settled on God. Um, you know, I, I 
honestly just felt like God had, had sort of brought my family to this point and then just dropped us off a cliff. And, uh, and so it was a bad year. I, I was bitter. I was depressed. Um, and then thankfully the next year, God got through to me in some pretty big ways. And he actually provided for me to go to Bible college in Wyoming. So at that point, uh, the next four years were kind of a whirlwind. I was going through school. I met my wife while counseling at a summer camp in Texas, my senior year. Nice. And we got married the summer after that. <laughs> So it, it was it was kind of funny. I avoided the whole, you know, ring by spring Bible college thing. I didn't meet my wife at Bible college, but I did meet her at a Christian summer camp. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so loophole kind of. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so we got married uh, the following summer in 2011. And at the same time, I had started an internship at a church in western Nebraska. So after we got married, we moved up here. And after my internship finished, I got hired on as the full-time youth pastor in 2012. So after essentially four years of living life at this blistering pace, um, you know, it was just like pedal to the floor, go, 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 getting all this stuff figured out. After that, things kind of settled down a little. And what started to float to the surface was the pain and the unanswered questions of what happened with my parents. And I started to get this sense that, you know, if I don't deal with this, like the pain and, and these things that I want to know that I keep coming back to, I started to get the sense it was going to define my future. And mm -hmm. I didn't want that to happen, but I also didn't know where to start. Yeah. And so I just kind of lived in that for that summer and, and into that fall. Were there fears of it um, impacting like your marriage? I think to a degree there was, um, you know, I think at that point I understood enough that, you know, I'm not my parents, I'm not my dad, I'm not my mom. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course there are questions, you know, my parents were married for 25 years before they split up and, you know, my dad's a pastor, grew up in a Christian home. Um, you know, of course there were questions and, and I think for me, it was just wanting to know, you know, like, like, where did it get wrong? You know, where did it go wrong? Could it have been fixed somehow? You know, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were definitely questions. So sometime that fall, I don't even remember who it was, but almost off the cuff, some old family friend mentions to me in passing about this old cabin in the Black Hills of South Dakota. It had been built right in the heart of the Black Hills, like only a few miles from Black Elk Peak, uh, very close to Sylvan Lake. And it had been built by old friends of my family. My grandpa had actually helped build some of it in the 50s. And my mom and my uncles and my aunts, who had been good friends with the kids of the people who owned it, uh, they played together and, and stuff like that. And even after they moved away from South Dakota, my family would make trips back there to stay at the cabin. And I, I had known that, I think. And on one of our family trips to South Dakota, we used to go on these camping trips, like with the whole family, with grandpa and grandma and aunts and uncles and cousins. Oh, wow. uh, I think they had taken us there and I had been there when I was very young, but it was so long ago and, and so much had happened. I mean, it was almost buried in my subconscious. I, I barely remembered it. Yeah. And then, you know, this old friend mentions it and, and some of it kind of came rushing back. And then the nail in the coffin for me was this person also mentioned that it was where my mom and dad had gone for their honeymoon. Oh. And I had totally forgotten about that. And I don't know how else to describe it. As soon as I heard that detail, it was like this thunderclap just boomed through my soul. Uh, all of a sudden, I, I knew where to go to find the answers that I'd been searching for. Like, it just all came together. And I was like, I've got to go see that cabin. Like, I don't know what is there, but I know that there's something there. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it I just had this sense of clarity I can't really explain. I, I knew I, I had to go find this cabin and I had to see it again for myself. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of how things started off. And then uh, I started planning to, to take a trip there. And it, it just kind of wound up that 
uh, that December, my wife was going to go after Christmas for a few days back to Texas where her family lived to visit them. And so I was going to have a few days essentially to myself. And really since college and getting married and starting my new job, it was kind of the first time I'd had to myself. And so it just kind of seemed natural to me that I'm going to go and, and try to see this place. And so I had a rough idea of where it was, and it sort of appealed to my sense of adventure to just leave that uh, a rough idea. You know, I kind of did what research I could. I knew the general area uh, where the cabin was. And so I, I thought, okay, I was looking at trail maps and stuff of that part of the Black Hills, the the large part of that part of the Black Hills is called the Black Elk Wilderness Area. And so I was looking at trail maps and stuff and kind of planning my route. And I thought it'd be fun to basically kind of make this loop through a good portion of the Black Elk Wilderness and sort of make the focal point of that backpacking trip over several days, finding the cabin and seeing it again. And I had done, you know, some hiking and camping throughout college and stuff, grew up camping with my parents in Wyoming and South Dakota and stuff like that. And, and I didn't really think about it too much beyond that. So had you like gone hiking and camping in winter before? Cause you said you were going to do this trip in December. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience uh, at that point. I had, you know, I had grown up skiing in the mountains in Colorado and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the winters in Colorado get plenty cold. And, and so I, I had experience with, with winter in general, but I had little experience actually backpacking in the winter. Uh, and it was definitely going to, that was definitely going to bite me in the rear. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I didn't have a whole lot of, of winter specific gear and stuff like that. And I didn't have a whole lot of frame of reference for what the experience of backpacking in the winter was going to be like. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just kind of my Achilles heel of optimism. I was just like, yeah, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Spoiler alert. I did not figure it out. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So at that point, um, my wife and I, we had two dogs. She had a little uh, papillon named Leo, and then I had just gotten a white German Shepherd puppy named Griffin. He was still pretty young at that point. I think he was only eight or nine months, and so I didn't take him. I actually left him uh, and the other dog with a friend of ours, and then I went on my trip. I drove up there, and it was really the first time I'd been back to the Black Hills you know, truly since I was young, you know, I'd been through the area a few times, but, you know, never in depth, never in the winter and never to these old places that, you know, my family used to go to and stuff like that. So even the drive itself, there was just kind of this heavy feeling over it. You know, I, I, I got this sense of like, there's a lot going on here, you know, and as I'm driving back up, I mean, even that the the weather and everything, you know, it's overcast, it's gray. There's just kind of this palpable sense of something bigger hanging in the air. It's hard to describe. And so the first mistake that I made was I didn't plan the driving route as good as I could have and wound up planning to go through a section of highway that was actually closed for the season. So I wound up having to backtrack and find another route, and that cost me a couple hours of time. Mm. And so by the time I got to the trailhead, which was the Willow Creek trailhead, kind of on the north side of the wilderness area, uh, it was like within an hour, an hour and a half of the sun going down, Mm. which was big mistake number one. Um, But, you know, me and my stubbornness, I just forged ahead. I was like, nope, I'm here. We're doing it. It's going to be fine. (laughs) and so I started hiking started out down the trail and I remember the first thing kind of the first indication that this isn't just gonna go the way that you're hoping that it goes in all of your you know sunny optimism and hopefulness (laughs) uh 
was noticing just how cold it was. I mean, it was incredibly cold. I think at the time it, it was at the time I started out, it was somewhere between zero and five degrees Fahrenheit. Oh my goodness. And I was just like, man, this is really cold. And, you know, I thought I had some decent gear. I thought I had some decent boots, some decent, you know, coats and pants and stuff. And, and it was just like, it was pathetic how, uh, how well they were not working. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, but still, you know, I just kind of forged ahead. I was like, well, I'm here, I'm going to do this, you know? And, and I was like, yeah, sure. There's going to be a little bit of a acclimation period but you know I can do this I can get used to this and so I hiked for a while down the trail and it's getting dark and um and you know I I think in my book um there's this there's sort of this crucial point where I had gone maybe about a mile or so the trail's still pretty easy it's pretty gentle I'm not really in the thick of the wilderness yet and I come to this gate. Um, there's there's like a fence and there's there's a gate on the trail that you just open and go through. And I I go through the gate. It's this big metal gate on a spring that closes it after you open it and go through. And I open the gate, I walk through, and I'm walking to the other side. You know, the shadows are starting to get longer. I'm sort of you know, kind of riding the line of, eh, am I okay? Am I not okay? You know, what exactly is going on here? And and then trying to not really think about it and just squash that voice. And the gate is closing on its spring behind me. And at this point, it just slams shut. And there's this big metal clanging sound. And it wound up being this pretty profound moment because it just felt like that just severed the tie between me and everything else in the world. All of a sudden, it's just me out there alone and I'm in it now and the phrase I think I used to describe that feeling in the book was I felt like you know if if I was swimming in the ocean and I swam out over you know like a drop off in the ocean and and now all of a sudden I'm in water that's way outside of my depth that was what it felt like and I kind of stood there for a second what I really had to start wrestling with is like, I'm scared. Like I I am afraid now I am out here. I am by myself. It is the winter. This is wild country. Like this is real wilderness. I'm scared. And at that point, I kind of just basically tried to like slap some sense into myself. It's like, okay, this is ridiculous. Just keep going. And I was like, I was shaken up and I was like, okay, well, I got a late start. Let me just find a spot to make camp. So I hiked a little further, went off the trail, right as the sun is going down, found kind of a spot on a low ridge that I felt would be a decent spot to make camp. And I start going about getting my tent set up and stuff. And, and it was so cold. I mean, it was so cold, you know, now that I'm not moving with my pack on anymore. And then there were a few parts setting the tent up that I had to take my gloves off for, uh, Mm -hmm. to use my fingers. And just in that short span of time, my hands just went white and completely numb from the Mm -hmm. cold. And at that point, you know, I'm just kind of doing busy work, getting the camp set up, getting a little something to eat. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, just get this done, get this done, get this done. I finally got everything done. The sun goes down and I get into my tent and I get into my sleeping bag. And that was kind of the next big mistake is I did not have a great sleeping bag at all. Uh, I think it's rated to like 30 degrees and it's already at least 30 degrees cold within that. Uh, and so I get in and I'm like, oh man, I'm cold. <laughs> uh, and so I kind of just tried to, I, I, you know, I'm wearing like all the extra fleece and socks and stuff that I, I possibly can. And I'm laying there shivering in my sleeping bag and it's cold. And, and then the next thing that happened is just like the quiet just swallows me. Uh, all of a sudden it's like, I'm trying to calm down and and go to sleep. And it's just like my brain 
gets this shot of adrenaline or something and all of a sudden I can hear everything you know I can hear the breeze going through the pine trees I can hear these soft snowflakes hitting the tent fabric uh you know I can hear twigs snapping in the distance and stuff and it was just like okay wow uh and I I tried to fall asleep and I, I did fall asleep for a little bit somehow, not sure how. Uh, and then I, I wake up and it was like, I woke up afraid. Like I woke up with just this current of terror coursing through my veins. And I didn't even know why. And I'm kind of freaking out and I get out my phone to look at what time it is. And it's only like seven o'clock, I think. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, how is it only seven o'clock? Um, and, and at that point, I started to really get worried about myself, like about my mental state and stuff. I, I was just freaked out, paranoid. And, and that was the first time I think that I really experienced what it was like to feel that kind of fear. Uh, you know, to be totally out there, totally isolated and alone, you know, no cell service, no, no lights from buildings, you know, no nothing. And I was terrified. And I, I wasn't even totally sure why it just it felt like fear itself had kind of manifested in the woods that night and was paying me a visit. Uh and I, I just like it, it it's even it, it's it's weird to talk about now, you know, experiencing just that raw emotion just coursing through me and and it you know, in the book I, I talk about how basically it, it felt like everything that I had ever been afraid of from my first childhood fear to now just kind of slipped the veil into the woods that night and it was overwhelming my senses. I mean, I was having a panic attack. Uh, and and in my panic, I just cried out to God. And I was like, you know, help me. Like, I, I, I don't know what to do here. Um, and, and that night was miserable. I didn't sleep at all the rest of the night. I just laid there in my sleeping bag, basically just terrified out of my wits the rest of the night until the sun came up. And... In the morning, you know, the sun comes up and I, I at least can kind of think straight again a little bit. And for some reason, you know, I mean, I know what the reason was, you know, I was young and inexperienced and stubborn, but for some reason I didn't take that as, you know, an example of, okay, we need to call this thing off. You know, we need to reevaluate. Um, I, I didn't do that. You know, I basically just kind of shoved the fear from the previous night down and was like, nope, I'm still doing this. Like, I'm still out here. Uh, it was so cold. <laughs> it was so cold that morning. Uh, I remember I had like a little, you know, jet boil stove and I made some ramen and I took the, the first sip of the ramen. It was like this heat wave that I could feel going all the way down to my toes. Oh that's how cold it was and so I just forged ahead I got back on the trail kept hiking and and it wasn't too much further after that that then I really got into the wilderness and the trail started to get really difficult it started to get steep I'm climbing an altitude there's snow on the ground so I can't see what the terrain is like underneath my feet and you know I mean at best, you've got uneven trail that has steps up and steps down. You got, you know, sharp angled rocks in places. And then it got even worse. I started to encounter basically that the Black Hills had a problem for a few years. It was really bad with pine beetles. And so there are beetle killed trees everywhere. And a bunch of them had fallen down all over the place and made these massive deadfalls all over. And, and, you know, some of them would just be, you know, three to four tree, you know, tree trunks that have fallen over the trail that you got to duck under or over or go around. But some of them would be just these massive piles of logs that just obliterated the trail for like 50 feet on either side. Whoa. 
And so trying to navigate through those in the snow, um, it was really slow going. It was really tough. And the, the ground, as soon as you got off the trail, I mean, it was bad enough on the trail with the snow and everything, but as soon as you got off the trail, you couldn't see because of the snow, what you were stepping on. You might be stepping on the ground or you might be stepping on a thin branch that was part of the deadfall and your foot was going to go through. And it kind of became this self-fulfilling prophecy where I started to think like, I'm going to step through and I'm going to roll my ankle on one of these things. And not very long after that, I did. Uh, I stepped on, you know, what I thought was ground and it wasn't. And, you know, a branch snapped under my foot and went down further, like six more inches. And I rolled my left ankle. Were you able to walk on it after that or was it pretty bad? It was pretty bad. I was able to limp a little bit, but I had rolled that ankle pretty bad a few times before. Mm -hmm. And so I had kind of been afraid of that happening the whole time. And then this was just kind of that confirmation. It was like, are you serious? Now I'm dealing with this too. (laughs) And so I rolled my ankle and there's sort of that initial, you know, just pain and, and kind of trying to take stock of the situation. That was kind of the last straw, I guess. Um, you know, it, it wasn't super bad. I could put weight on it, but at that point it was pretty hard to, it was pretty hard to rationalize continuing on at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I, I kind of sat on a, a log for a second, just kind of trying to recover, I guess a little bit. And and I, it really, it was hard because this is like, ugh, I don't want to quit this. And then my brain instantly goes like, yeah, you do. <laughs> um, and in the book, I, I, I talk about it like it was a wilderness holding up a mirror. And me being unable to look away. And all of a sudden, I had to confront who I really was not who I, you know, not who I thought I was or not who I wanted to be. Um, all of a sudden, all of my shortcomings, my lack of preparedness, and and really just how not tough in any sense of the word I really was. I had to look all that stuff in the face right then and there. And it made me really uncomfortable. And ultimately, I, I did decide to turn around and, and stop and go back. Um, and so I, I limped like the three, four miles back to my car and drove home. And for the first, you know, I mean, I, I got home and I'm just kind of, you know, like everything is normal. Like, yeah, that wasn't great. Um, but, you know, it's normal. And there's kind of this, you know, comforting blanket that comes back over you when you get home of like, you know, here's all my convenience and my technology and my distractions. Um, and so for a while, you know, it was just like, okay, you know, it's back to normal. And then that night around the house, I just started to notice things that were different. Like it was like, I've never noticed all these shadows in here before. Like it's still daylight outside, but it's dark. <laughs> what's what's with this? Or, you know, I'm like, man, I'm feeling really cold. And I look at the thermostat and it's normal. Like it should be warm in here, but I, I felt cold and I, I couldn't shake it off, you know, but still I'm like distracting myself with technology and, and stuff like that. And And I go to bed that night. And as soon as I got in bed and turned off the lights, it was just like everything, you know, my house got ripped from around me and all of a sudden I was teleported back into the Black Hills, back into, you know, the exact same fear that I had experienced the night before. And I started having another panic attack. I was just completely overwhelmed. And and at that point, I'm I'm wondering, what have I done? You know, what what is going on that I'm still feeling this here and experiencing this here. And it felt pretty dire at that point. Like I, I I didn't know what to do. And, and I, like I said, I was having a full blown panic attack and all of a sudden something snapped me out of it. 
and I felt this weight on my legs and it was my dog Griffin. He had jumped up on the bed and he was laying across my legs. It it just, it kind of snapped me out of it. And he laid across my legs like that. He, He had never done that before. He usually slept on the floor. He laid across my legs like that all night long. And I was actually able to sleep and he only got up and moved when the sun had come up the next morning. And that was kind of the first indication I had that he's connected to this too. Like, like there's, there's some part of this experience that he has to play. And for a while after I got back, um, you know, I, I kind of told my wife, how the experience went and how it affected me. I think she was kind of the only one. And what I really tried to do was reframe the experience in a way where I could just kind of walk away from it. And to everyone else, you know, to the outside world, I kind of painted this picture of an experience that even though it hadn't gone exactly the way I planned, you know, because of rolling my ankle and stuff, you know, it did what I needed it to do, like mission accomplished pretty much. Yeah. And uh, that was, you know, kind of indicative of this pattern that I've had all my life to reframe negative experiences in order to avoid squaring up with the pain, you know, and taking responsibility and actually doing the messy work of healing, you know, of of actually sitting with it and and figuring out how I really feel about this and and what God is trying to say to me about it. I I tried doing that and it, very quickly I I just had to face the reality of the fact that that's not going to work this time. You know, I I couldn't reframe this experience. And for a while I tried, I tried really hard. Um, but first of all, just in the privacy of my own mind, it haunted me. It, it, there's no other way to describe it. The, that experience haunted me every single day. It would be the last thing that I thought about before I went to sleep at night. And the first thing that was on my mind when I woke up Hmm. and literally every second of the day, I wasn't thinking about something else. I was thinking about this. And so it was probably only a a month or two, if that, after that, that I already knew it, you know, it's the last thing I want to do, but I have to go back. I, I have to not only go back there, but I have to go back alone again. I have to go back under the same set of circumstances. I, I can't explain exactly why I knew it had to be that way. I just knew that it did. Well, guys, I actually am going to pause this recording with Joe Patterson because it actually turns out to be a really long story. So we're actually going to split this up between three or four episodes. Um, And let me tell you that this is just a small taste of what crazy and courageous turns that uh, Joe ends up facing. So I'm going to encourage you to tune back in next week to hear more of just how crazy and exciting this story turns out to be. So until next time, safe travels and God bless.